And the Spice Girls were a global phenomenon who were fearless, you were known as invincible, and you actually invented girl power. And yet, 20 years later, you found yourself writing these words. I know what it's like to be beaten down. I know what it's like to be punched, humiliated, and isolated, and to feel there is no way out. Your ex even called you ugly, a slut, disgusting, fat, stupid, a bitch, worthless, pathetic, a monkey, and derelict. And the most common things women have said to me over the past years is, but you're such a strong woman. How did this happen to you? So what I want to know is how did you go from girl power to powerless? Abuse can happen to anybody, whether you're successful or not. Usually happens to people that have a bit of money or a bit of kabaz about themselves because an abuser, you know, I, I always say it's their job and you do your job good, I do my job good. So an abuser, if that's their job, they have to be good at it because if they abuse you, they get to have your lifestyle, your money, they get to control you, and they get to have complete power over you. And it happens very gradually. That's why abusers never stop. And throughout my 10 year marriage, I had no idea that he already had a criminal charge for domestic violence from a prior relationship. I had no idea until I actually left him. So they're good at what they do. And abuse finds you. You don't, you don't go, oh right, I really want a really nice relationship and then I want it to be abusive. No, the abuser sniffs you out and seeks you out. And they come into your world, into your life like a knight in shining armor. And you are literally love bombed and flawed. Like, how is this person even possible? They're everything I've ever dreamed of. And that's why they're so good at what they do. And they do the same thing at the same time over and over. They chip away at your personality, they isolate you, and before you know it, you are stuck and you don't feel like you can get out. And then that life becomes normal, terrifying and traumatizing, but it comes normal because you're hiding this dirty, dark secret because you don't want anybody else to know about that stuff. That's horrible. We all have the same story. It's not like these abusers change up how they do things. They do the same thing over and over and over again. That's why I want to challenge, if we already have the information of how they do stuff, I want to challenge it and make sure that us women, because it predominantly happens to women, mm -hmm. it does happen to men too, but predominantly women, I want to challenge what they do and keep us women safeguarded from the court system to any kind of relationship you have, I want to make sure you know what a healthy relationship looks like. Thank you for breaking that down. So it's these manipulation tactics that feel good Big in the time. moment. Because Big going back time. to the initial opening of this, it's like you are girl power. And yet it is so beautiful that you're so open with this. Because I have no choice but to be honest and open because I lived like a secret dark life for 10 years up to a point where it just got too much. Mm. And an unfortunate situation, my father died and his death gave me the strength and the courage to leave. If it wasn't for my father passing away with cancer, God rest his soul, would I have, would have, would I have had the strength to leave? I don't know, I tried to leave six times before, but I don't know. And the, and the, and the thing is, if you stay in any kind of abusive relationship, it's like a death wish because there's three women that die every single week right now by they're killed by their former partner or their current partner so if we don't make a cultural change and educate the next generation educate our kids what a healthy relationship looks like educate the justice system educate the police that attend mm -hmm. domestic abuse call outs then it's a dark slippery slope for us women yeah I completely agree and I think that that's exactly what you're doing is you're educating them on the things that people don't even realize is the manipulation that gets them then stuck because to your point it's like you, you're so freaking strong as a woman as to who you stand up to be. And but your what voice. is strong? I mean strong. Yeah, I've, I don't even class myself as strong. I class myself as just, no, well before all the abuse, knowing who I am and having a strong moral opinion. Mm. You know, because I was brought up, my dad's black from Nevis, my mum's white English rose. They already had their difficulties coming together in the 70s and then producing a mixed race child that there weren't that many around. So they instilled in me a lot of like morals and confidence and just be who you are. 
But I tell you what, when I say strong then, because I love being who you are actually is a sign of strength, especially when so many women don't actually know who they are because they haven't been encouraged to do that. Yeah. So you do that, right? You do all the work. And over time, that's the key. It's the over time of like, have you ever seen like a water drip on a rock that it actually yeah. eventually yeah. changes the shape of its rock? Mm -hmm. Right. So that's how I feel about your character, right? That, that it starts to drip on you over time and so that your shape starts to change and over time like you said 10 years later you don't actually recognize who you are mm -hmm. so if you don't mind actually taking me through a couple of just even almost yeah. the tactics that your ex used so that women listening right now oh yeah can recognize if they're in it because that's the problem some women don't even recognize well i didn't realize how badly abused right. i'd been mm -hmm. my dear friend louise gallon who wrote the book with me she um sat down in front of me one day and she said have a look at this and I was like, oh, it's got 15 like bullet points. I was like, oh, that's the timeline of my marriage. And she went, no, this is from a website, a charity called Women's Aid. And these are the 15 signs of what abuse looks like. And I was like, I tick every single box. And at that moment, I was like, obviously I knew I was being abused. And I was so riddled with embarrassment and shame and guilt because I had kids that you know, I'm raising and trying to protect them from this guy during that, that marriage. And it's, it's, a strange, it's a strange place that you find yourself. And that's why I have a lot of empathy why women go back because in some ways, in a strange, ridiculous mind thought, you think, well, this person did love me, but now he's blackmailing me, he's telling me he's gonna send pictures out to my work people or try and take my kids away from me or say that I'm a bad mum or expose that I was self-medicating when I was with him. You know, what do I what do I do? How can I protect myself? Oh, it's just safer if I go back because and it's never safer because that's a death wish. Abusers, they won't stop abusing until you stop them, until you get away. But then that's a whole different journey you have to take on when you finally removed yourself. You're so conditioned that you're bad, you're unworthy, you can't make decisions, you're crazy, you're psycho. You end up going, God, I can't even trust myself anymore. If I can't trust myself, how am I gonna trust anybody else? Mm. And you end up apologizing, or you know that they've just mm. abused you, but then they're asking you if you want a cup of tea. So you go, they're being nice to me now. Have I just made that up? What just happened? And you, just, everything just starts to be, you question your everything. And that's why abusers are so good at what they do. That is their number one job. And they do it very well. That's why they've gotten away with it for years. They can manipulate the justice system. They can manipulate a policeman if they come to your door, even though you've called for, for help. You know, they're, they're just very good. That's their number one job. They don't have any other job. Nine times out of 10, abusers don't really work because they want to make sure that you work and they want to keep an eye on you, where you're going, who you're talking to. Everything's like clocked, where in the beginning it seems like, oh, he just really cares about me. You know, he's, he's um, picking me up from work again, or he's making sure that he goes to go and see the accountant because, you know, I was really tired because I've just done a 10 hour day. No, they're manipulating you and they're, doing things that you're going to later find out about and it's going to be shocking if so it's, it's not already shocking. So it's slowly taking the control drip, bit by drip, bit. Drip, 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 drip. I mean, if, you know, an abuser doesn't start abusing you straight away, they make sure that they've got you in a great, beautiful position where you are just in love with that person. You know, they can't say anything wrong. They're just showering you with compliments and they're your rock and they're there for you. And then bit by bit, it just starts to change from, oh, your friend look good, looks good in that outfit, for example. And then you think, why is he complimenting my friend? And then before you know it, oh, I've bought you a dress in maybe the same color or same design. That, so you start going, oh, well, well, I know he likes this then. They're just very good at what they do. And that's why this book is so important on so many levels. Not only did it cathartically help me understand what had gone on, but I know that I'm not the only one. And the statistics are the statistics. Women are dying. They're getting killed by their current partner or former partner. 
So we need to make a cultural change that actually does change and change changes the way that we engage and how we what we allow or don't allow because abusers it's not that you allow them to abuse you they're good at just doing it mm -hmm. and before you know it it's been done to you over and over again and you're like how did i get here you go to call your friends oh your friend's not picking up the phone to you anymore because you cancelled three lunches with her you didn't cancel it do you see what i mean mm -hmm. so you when you're out of it and that's why it was so good for me to chronologically get this book in order because louise who louise gallon who wrote the book with me she got um 15 other people's memories and opinions and actual events that they'd witnessed and these are really like you know respectable people in the industry from x factors accountant who saw my money go in my account and saw it get taken out and so this book is not a he said, she said, this is a factual story of what happened. So that's why I've never been sued for this book because it's the truth and it's not just my word. And how much I wonder in you, what you just said is they're using the isolation so that they don't, you don't have the people around you like no. the accountant saying, hey, do you know that your money just left? No. So that separation. But that happens bit mm -hmm. by bit by bit, you know? And I think we owe it to ourselves as women to kind of just take a stance and say enough is enough. Because, you know, if you look at those 15 signs of abuse, we know what they're doing now and how they're doing it. So we're one step ahead in so many ways. But, you know, us girls, we like to feel adored and respected and loved and appreciated, but don't underestimate that that could be part of an abuser's scheme. I'm not just saying that everyone's an abuser, mm. no, but abusers know what to do and when to do it. They're and very clever. That's the problem with something like love bombing, especially because it feels so good. And you can be yeah. like, what do you mean he's manipulating me? He's buying me flowers. He's treating me lovely. And yeah. it's that like gotcha moment, right? Uh, yeah. Where they're trying to, you know, really capture you. And, and that's why they separate your friends and family away from you bit by bit, mm -hmm. because they can all see it. And abuse, when you're being abused, it doesn't just happen to you. It kind of filters out to your friends, your family, and they see that you're being isolated, but you don't see it straight away. I mean, when I um, got out of my marriage, my father died 2017, went on tour with the Spice Girls in 2019, and I'm doing Wembley Stadium, but I'm living in Leeds with my mum at this in her small, tiny bungalow with my three kids because you know, I check my bank account, where's all my money gone? It just, pff, like, right from underneath me in plain sight, and I would never thought, you never think, somebody who loves and cares for you would never hurt you, or if they say something mean, you know, they apologize, I'll never say that again, or I'll never do that again, and you want to believe them, because you treat people how you would like to be treated. If you're, love, if you're in a love relationship, you know, I know you didn't mean it, and then it just escalates from there and it goes on and on. I mean, I've, I've spoken to survivors that have been in a relationship for 20 years. I've spoken to survivors that have been in a, in a relationship for two months. And the impact of the trauma that that leaves you with, it's never going to leave me that trauma. I can't undo or unsee or unfeel what I've been through. But what I can do is educate other survivors on how you can start to heal yourself. But just know if you try and block that out, it will come back with PTSD. You have to know it's not your fault and you have to get tools and be kind to yourself. Because, you know, as women, we kind of take on a lot. And especially if there's kids involved, you've got the whole guilt and shame, which never really goes, but you have to just say to yourself, I did not intend to be in that kind of relationship. I came here with good intentions. Yeah, you say in your book about how shame is like that really hard thing because you feel the shame, you then don't want to say anything because of the shame and then the shame Can't fuels Can't say anything to it. anybody else, no way. But your abuser will make sure that you feel it. Mm. And then yeah. you even say about the isolation, that they try to isolate you and God... Don't I mean, try, they do. They do. There's a line in your book, it broke my heart, where your mum's giving you advice. And you're like, huh. Mum, maybe that's right. Let me go talk to him. 
and you go up to him and you say, my mum says, and then it just says dot, dot, dot. I didn't speak to my mum for eight years after that. Yeah. Because they twist everything, you know. And then before you know it, you think, does my mum really care about me? I'm in love. Why isn't she happy for me? There's so many things that they can twist. And I'm just giving like real examples, mm. but from other survivors, I mean, we all have the same thing in common. The isolation, the um, taking control over your phone, your car keys, house keys, credit cards, everything. Mm. It all starts to just happen, but it happens bit by bit by bit. You know, so that's why I'm like, I need to get that message out. Because when I brought this book out, nobody was talking about abuse. Nobody I knew, nobody I knew in the public eye. The only thing that I could think of was Tina Turner when she did that movie, What's Love Got To Do mm -hmm. With It? And apart from that, which was way back, I mean, I didn't even know that there was, I mean, I knew that there was helplines, I knew that there was safe places and safe houses to go, but what am I, I'm gonna call them? Well, where's my phone? What do I say? I'm, I'm, I mean, I didn't even know what I would say in that situation. So it's a case of now we have um, a conversation. Now it's a, we've got like things in place where we can support women going through that. I just did a massive talk with Netflix and Spotify and I've managed to get them to get HR within that workplace mm. where HR is educated that they can spot somebody because my thing was my work was my safe place. It was when I went home that it wasn't safe. So to spot the signs of somebody feeling agitated or a bit pins and needles right before they have to go home, you know, go and talk to them. HR, it's confidential. And now we have lines with my charity Women's Aid, you can call up anonymously and they will help you get that train for free. They will help you go to a safe house. They will make sure that if you're on benefits or if you don't have any money that they can get support in place while you figure out, you know, what's just happened to you in your life. Wow, what other signs are there then of someone? Oh, there's so many. But like, so, so like that, that agitating going to home, I wouldn't have even, I wouldn't have put the two things together. Well, don't forget, you know, if you're a woman that wants to be independent, you take yourself to work. And then if you're in a relationship that's abusive, they're not gonna come and abuse you, abuse you at work right. because that's your workplace. Mm -hmm. So you feel safe at work. And it's that, right, God, I've got an hour before I need to go home. I've got half an hour and then you start, you can feel the anxiety and you can see it. So much so when I was doing America's Got Talent filming, Simon Cowell decided to ban my then husband from set. He's like, you act different when he's around. Mm -hmm. I'm like, didn't want to say anything because that's my dirty little secret that I don't want anyone to know about. Um, and then it was, right, he's, I banned him because I want you to be you because this is live TV, this is America's Got Talent. So we'd finish a day of filming and I'd go in my dressing room and I'd be like, I'm, I'm just gonna stay mm. half an hour longer in the dressing room, but I didn't want to go home. And then it was, your driver's been waiting outside for an hour, you know, the show's over, go home because that was unsafe. I felt safe at work. And so by introducing and educating HR within the workplace, mm -hmm. we've got that bit covered because I know for a fact from speaking to survivors, from doing it myself, your work is your safe place. It's when you leave work, you're thinking, am I gonna, am I gonna come back tomorrow? And what shape am I gonna be in? And is anyone gonna notice? Yeah, well that notice piece as well was so powerful because let's face it, a lot of the abuse isn't physical. A lot of it is so mental and there's no scars, if you will, on the outside for someone no. to be able to see that. So no. there's no identification. And I don't know if it's still the case, but I believe the law in California was that, um, was it coercive control? Coercive control just got, Coercive control just got put into effect in 2015 in England. Coercive control just got put into effect in Australia, but not till next year. In LA, I'm not sure where it lies, mm. coercive control, but I do know if it's not a law now, I think it's in the making. And also stature of limitations. So if I want to report mm. domestic abuse in England, you know, I can take my time and heal from it. And actually, if I want to admit it and want to go on the record, there's no time limit. Whereas in LA, you have, I think it's five years to report that crime. After five years, you may not still be over that trauma. 
You may still be like trying to figure out, right, the, and now I've got PTSD. I remember when I first, you know, started to realize what PTSD meant to me, a door would slam and I'd jump out of my skin because that took me right back mm. to something bad happening physically. And I had to be able to say to my brain, you're not there anymore, you're here, but you are literally trying to cope, just like you were trying to cope in the abuse, you then have to cope on the outside world. And you know, you're vulnerable. You're still trying to piece yourself back together. You're still trying to give yourself confidence. You're still trying to trust your instinct. And it's like, well, if I trusted that and I was in love with that, I can't trust this. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's support from family and friends and relatives. You know, if I'm an alcoholic, I can go to AA. I can get my family and friends to go to Analon, right? If I've been abused, where do I go? Apart from a charity like Women's Aid to get therapy, because it's like we're still not taking into account what you have been through. There should be specific hubs and safe places for you to go to as a woman that's been suffering a bruise. You have it for alcohol, you have it for NA, you have it for sex addiction, you have it for everything else. And my thing is, is because it's seen as a woman's problem, because it happens to 99% of women, it happens to men too, but it's like, we're the strongest species on the, in, on the, in this world, in the planet. We give birth, we nurture, you know, we can, like, like, why aren't we taking care of our own and having that support system, having that line? Of, we are getting better because from 2017 to 2024, now, we, now we're talking about it. Now it's, we can talk about it on The View. We can watch TV shows on Netflix, Dirty John and uh, Happy Valley where it, we can understand it more. But it's been a long time coming. And I, maybe in this lifetime, I won't completely change the justice system, but I'm gonna keep on trying until I do. You know, I've got a pact of warriors behind me that are like, yes, because they don't have that platform, yet we've been through exactly the same things. Mm -hmm. So my voice is not only for myself and my own sanity somewhat, mm -hmm. but it's for all those other women that didn't have that voice. Most of them barely made it by the skin of their teeth. And then they're going through the justice system where the judges don't even realize you're putting a child now in custody with this perpetrator. Like 19 kids died over the last year or so in England because they the judges put them with the abuser, thinking, believing the abuser, oh, the woman's crazy, she's just crazy, see? See, she doesn't want to let me, to see. She's, she's not allowing me to see my kids. Well, let's do it monitored custody. If you're working damn hard to kick ass and be unfreaking stoppable, there's one thing I know for a fact that you need to actually show up confident and ready for anything, and that's sleep. That's why I want to introduce you to the secret to better sleep, Cozy Earth. Cozy Earth's luxury bedding products are crafted with temperature regulating technology so you're not waking up covered in sweat and then shivering 10 minutes later. And they use super soft and breathable materials that literally feel like a cloud on your skin. I'm officially obsessed. They are literally the softest sheets I've ever felt and so I definitely would recommend giving Cozy Earth a try. Treat yourself right now to ultimate comfort with Cozy Earth bedding and make your sleep a priority so that you can actually show up every day with confidence and kick ass. Click the link below or head over to CozyEarth.com and use the promo code LISA to save an exclusive 35% off right now. Upgrade your nights, transform your days with Cozy Earth. You've said this multiple times, but it feels it's such a specific technique that they use. So you talk And it's the same technique mm -hmm. as old as old as time can be. Like if you look in the back of my book, The 15 Signs, and you'll go, oh God, I didn't, didn't realize that that was that mm. strange. You know, so tells you that you can never do anything right. Might say that just a few times as a joke, but then start to say it really and it, you, you become demeaned a little bit and disrespected, but you think, no, I can do something, right? It goes on and on. Shows extreme jealousy of your friends and time spent away. So baby, I miss you, don't go, don't go, don't go and spend the weekend with you girls. And you think, oh my God, it so loves me. No. Mm. Keeps you or discourages you from seeing your friends or family members, isolation. Insults, demeans or shames you and puts you down. Maybe he'll just whisper it in your ear if you're out and about, or maybe he'll say it screaming in your face when you're at home. 
happens, controls every penny spent in the household because they're taking care of you. Mm. So you think. But they're probably stashing the money somewhere else. Takes your money or refuses to give you money for necessary expenses. So now it's like you're living on a budget because at this point everything's a little bit school whiff so you can't really remember the last time you even bought yourself something. But remember, we're on a budget now, so you start to believe we're doing it for the household, for the kids, we're gonna get a trust fund. No, it's all manipulation. And us even having then to ask the permission is another form of the control. Oh yeah. Looks at you or acts in, in a way that scare you, controls who you see, where you go, what you do, prevents you from making your own decisions, will question you constantly. So you think, well, what's the, is that the right decision? Do you know what, let me just, maybe it's not. What, what, what do you think? And then that's their segue in. Tells you that, this is, a, good, this is a, a very common one, tells you that you're a bad parent or threatens to harm or take away your children. That's classic. And then the last thing you wanna be when you're in the middle of abuse is your partner telling you that you're a bad parent. That is devastating. And that's embarrassing and shameful. And, but wait a minute, you know you're a good parent. Prevents you from working or attending school. Destroys your property or thre threatens to hurt or kill you or your pets. Very common also. Intimidates you with guns, knives or other weapons. Classic. So we know all this. Pressures you to have sex when you don't want to do things sexually. And things that you're not comfortable with sexually. Pressures you to use drugs or alcohol and probably provides it to you. Mm. Yeah. Because the self-medicating is also very, very common because sometimes it's the only way you can get through another day with that person. So that's what I was gonna ask. How do you go from this person that you've said you feel broken, you're on the floor, you're taking pills, you're one, you literally try to take your own life. You take over something like 200 pills mm -hmm. or something. And I wrote my letter saying to my mom, just please look after my kids because what kind of life are they living? Not that they see a lot, but kids can feel and the energy of the house, they, they feel it. And I can't live in this life um, a second longer. How do you go from that to feeling like you're alone, you're lost, you don't have friends, you don't talk to your mum, your parents? I mean, you felt completely lost and alone. Broken, and that is what they thrive off. To see you broken, to see you, you know, on the floor like a wreck, because guess what? The abuser now is the only person that can actually rescue you. Mm. How convenient is that? Very convenient for them, of course. And even in your book, you say, you know, he's throwing like insults and just total words that cannot ever be repeated. They're just so harsh. And then at the end, he even says, aren't you lucky that I love you? And that type of manipulation where they've broken you down, they've isolated you, and then they compound it with, but I'm here for you, aren't yeah. you lucky? Because nobody else is gonna want you. Yeah. Look at the state of you. So, no, I'm not saying that no, about no. you. Just, <laughs> just, just be very it's clear. It's all right, Mel B can say anything to <laughs> me. Let's just be very clear, talking about an abusive, <laughs> in, know, a, in an abusive situation. Yeah, yeah. And the, the, the reason why I am so adamant to speak about this and I'm so on my mission is because it's happening too much, mm. too many times. I just had a friend of mine that her best friend's daughter has just committed suicide. No, she hasn't. Now the police are saying it's a suspicious death and she was in a very abusive relationship and the mother reported it to the police five times. They said, well, you know, you're the mum. The daughter needs to report it, and now look, now they're having to do a whole investigation. But then sometimes, even when you're the person that's getting abused and you call the police, you then worry about the knock-on effects oh, of them getting arrested. And the thing is, when the police show up, the police aren't that, that educated on what mm. domestic abuse looks like. In England, there's a domestic abuse call every 30 seconds. Every 30 seconds. So you imagine the amount of money that our government has to spend in, in the UK funding and paying for this service. Well, just put the, put the money into the services right now in educating the justice system, educating schools, having more safe houses and trying to, just to stop abuse bit by bit by bit because it's rising. It's not, it's not getting 
like lower is getting even higher mm. and now more and more people are talking about it. you know when i brought out this book it was before the me too before the harvey, harvey weinstein stuff but it was mm. going on it's like everyone knows about it but no one dare talk about it oh, well i spoke about it and i thought it was going to end my career i thought that was going to be it because i'm girl power but i'm girl powerless but i took my power back fuck yeah so how do other people who maybe don't have that because you were like, I, I don't know if this is going to end my career, right? Well, Your I had my dream. mum and my daughter. My mum and my daughter have both written their, their own chapters in, in, in this book. And if it wasn't for them, like, saying, how many other people? Do? Look, you, you can help other people. And the thought that I could help somebody else, I was like, fuck it, publish it. And it, it actually helped my career because I've got an MBE given to me by yeah. Prince William for all my campaigning. You know, I've made changes in the law. I speak about abuse whenever I can. And it's never a, an appropriate time to talk about abuse, but if it's happening to women all the time, then I'm gonna stand up for myself as a woman and all the other women. Okay, so if someone's listening right now and they're amped, they're like, okay, you've just laid out the groundwork for, to identify that yes, I am in an abusive relationship. And now I don't know what to do. You can, there's so many lines yeah. of support now that you can call up anonymously. But my number one thing is get the fuck out of there. Mm. Take your kids, take whatever you can, get out of there. Get out of there. If not, it's a death wish. And it is that, it's that black and white. How did Literally. you go from then being the person that was using so many different coping mechanisms in order to, to just get through, whether that be drugs or sex or work, you like list the whole things of like, I was just trying to numb and distract myself. Yeah, So, but sex not with anybody else, with him. Yeah, yeah, sorry, thank you, yes. Yeah. But, but how do you go from that to being like, the woman that's sitting here right now saying, yes, the book's out, I'm changing well, I it. I mean, like I said before, if it wasn't for my father dying, and him on his deathbed, me promising him, Dad, because he was holding on and he had cancer. There was no way this time round he was gonna recover from it because mm. my dad suffered from cancer. It, he would get um, treatment, he'd be fine, he'd go into recovery, be healthy again, then the cancer would come back. It came back time and time again. This time when it came back, there was no coming back from this one. And he just, you know, he, he wanted to hold on and hold on. And I was like, what can I say to help him pass over? Because there's no coming back from the state that he's in right now. It was just all over his body at that point. And I just thought, you know what, Dad, if you just pass on now, just I promise you, I will go back to LA and divorce that monster. And he looked at me like that as if to say, yes, finally, you've said it, and took his last breath. So I don't know if I hadn't have had that tragedy happen, and I promised my father, I'm such a daddy's girl, you know, would I have had the strength? My dad gave me that strength to do that. And the last thing you want to do with my dad is not keep a promise, let me tell you. <laughs> let me tell you that right now. He's you never back forget, and You sure. never forget where you come from, you eat your vegetables, and you don't lie, and you never, you never break a promise with my dad. End of. Mm. So what do you think that did you then internally? Oh, I, I've promised my dad. And now my dad's passed over, so I owe it and I'm not gonna break that promise. Wow, so what was that very next day look like in your actions? Well, I had to fly back to LA, took my kids and left. And you didn't say a word to your ex? How proud are you right now of having left? I'm not, because it's funny, because, you know, for, fortunately, I've got the money to have been able to pay f for certain types of therapy, because mm. I found talking about it is like reliving it. So I had alternative therapy that really helped me. I had EMDR, I had transcranial neurostimulation. I had a mm. bunch of, that sounds quite barbaric. But um, yeah, just talking about it in, in a weird way for me now feels very empowering because that did happen to me. I'm not going to deny it. And now I'm on a mission to help other people, but by doing that, I help myself every single time I talk about it. How did you then go from getting PTSD? Because you, you even write in your book, everyone was like, oh, you left now, you should be fine. But There's the PTSD. Two things, two things that people say is, mm. why didn't you leave him earlier? <sighs> Let me break it down. I tried to leave six or seven times. When I left, where do I go? 
I've got no phone, no credit card. Uh, I can't call my mum. You know, it's like, and then, and then it is, well, you've left him now. You should feel fine. Uh, no, I have to rebuild my whole trust and self-respect and self-esteem. And I'm riddled with shame and guilt. I've got to, I'm on a mission now to protect my kids. And now I've got to sort myself out. So once you did that, how did you then build your self-esteem back so that you can be well, the person that's sitting here and saying, I'm going to help everyone My spy skills came to the rescue. We went on tour, did loads of stadiums, and I lived with my mother during the pandemic. <laughs> so I had nowhere else to go apart from right by mum's so side. So did the pandemic help you, do you think? <laughs> Well, when you're locked in a house with your mother mm. and then you have to ex you have to say sorry to her and she has to say sorry to me because I'm like, why didn't you come and save me? And my mum's like, why didn't you call me? I had to amend that, that. I mean, I would call my mother three, four, five times a day. I went from that to not seeing her for eight years. There was a lot of mending and the pandemic hit. <laughs> and I'm with my mum and my three kids in a really small bungalow. But then I'm off to Wembley Stadium, but then I'm back with my mum. And that time, it was very fiery. We got a lot of rage out, a lot of sadness, a lot of anger, but it brought us close together. Because anybody that's left abuse has trauma. And trauma is not gonna go away lightly. Mm. It's not ever gonna completely go, but it can get small. That little voice of trauma can get smaller and smaller and smaller over time. And this is why we have to, you know, your body, your body holds and stores stuff. So the more you can say, to your body and your brain. I'm sorry that I put you through that, but it was out of my control, but I can control this. And we start building up our resilience and you know, managing our flight or fight and our panic and our anxiety and our PTSD. Mm -hmm. There's a book called The Body Keeps the Score. I've just been listening to that Have you I've really? just been listening to ah, it, It's yes. good, right? Really, really good. It's so yeah. powerful because I don't think we realize, and as women, we sometimes ignore our gut instincts or gut intuition. We do. And especially if you've been love bombed, you're thinking, but Darren Paper has been so nice. You know, why have I got this icky feeling? Listen to that gut. Because then if you, if you don't listen to it, you know what? It'll start to get twisted into, well, I'm just gonna listen to him. Mm -hmm. Don't give that power away. But that's why I've put the 15 signs of what abuse looks like. So we, could, we have, you know, we have a starting point of, well, if any of those are happening to you, even a tiny bit, finish it, end it, get out. They're not gonna change. And I think it's important to talk about those icky things. Yeah, the, talking about them and then naming them. So like gaslighting, I'd heard, I didn't really know what it was. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what coercive control was. Like who thought of that word? Like I can't, I can't even spell it. Well, I'm <laughs> dyslexic, but yeah. It's like think of something mm -hmm. that, that actually appeals to me I, where I can understand it. I don't have to then look it up in the dictionary and go, oh, that's what it means. Do you know where gaslighting came from? Go on, tell me. So it was like back in the olden days where they actually had like light gas lights. Yeah. And so a husband wanted to basically make his woman feel like she was going crazy. So every single day he would turn the light down just enough. And she'd be like, why is it getting dark in here? And he's like, I don't know what you mean. It's not getting dark. That's why I put the frog um, the boiling the analogy. Frog. Because if you put a frog in boiling water, it's going to jump right out, right? Like if you put somebody in an abusive situation, they're going to go, what the fuck, get, get away. Where the frog, if you put it in water and it, it's barely even hot and then you just turn up the heat bit by bit. So then as an abuser, you can just watch that frog die. It doesn't realize it's dying. You just go, oh, it's kind of getting hot in here. Yeah. You've taken us through how you identify. Everything, I've you... just purged it all dude, out. this is so important because people don't necessarily know if they're going through or not. And for them I know, to and know I didn't realize how badly abused I've been until it came to me sitting down with Louise, my dear friend, and trying to piece my life together because I was still in denial and I was still full of shame and guilt. And so she very cleverly went out and reached out to people that I'd worked with that had seen certain situations or were privy to overhearing things of, of him talking to me like that or, or witnessing things or witnessing like in public the hand being gripped tight or seeing my dead eyes or me wearing certain outfits to cover certain bruises or whatever up. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, I mean, to this day, my ex denies he's ever been abusive to me, but I've written all about it in this book. He's never once sued me. 
if it was a lie, come and sue me. Mm. He's already got a criminal record for domestic violence from a prior relationship. I wish I would have known that. I wish I would have known these signs because then maybe I would have gone, oh, I remember I read a book with those signs. That kind of, oh, yeah, that rings true. Oh, let me just back off a little bit because you're coming on a bit too strong. Mm-hmm. That scene when you go on the X Factor and yeah. you just like with your ring off and you're just showing your bruises is one of those moments. I'm like, fuck you. I'm at work. You can't get me now. My ring's off. I come from the hospital, pulled all the <laughs> intravenous things out. I was like, you are not stopping me from my work. My work is my work. You're not hired to be you. You're just an abuser who sponges off other people's money and tailcoats and fame, and then you're gonna control that. This is my world, I control my work. But then, a few weeks later, I went back, because he's in America with one of my kids, and my kids are my everything. And that's that kind of spiral vicious where it's circle. just a vicious cycle. Yeah. Um, okay, so you've expressed exactly how you ended up powerless, yeah. how you identified it, how you actually got out of now it. Now I identify yeah, it. Yeah. And now, like I said, you know, if it wasn't for my dad, unfortunately, tragically dying from cancer, would I have stayed longer? Would I have even, would I be alive today? Probably not. But you are, my homie, and you've got I a am. book to help other women around the world. That's the most important thing. So I'm really screaming girl power with my girls and screaming girl power for all those survivors because they're not alone and it was never their fault. Oh, my God. Repeat that last line. I can't because you look at me like that. Now I'm going to cry. I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. Because it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate that... You know, I went through this, all the other women went, went through this, but we can do something about it. We can educate one another. We can support one another. One another. When, you, when your friend cancels that lunch for the second time, find out if it's actually her that's cancelling it. Go make a point of just being there. You know, there's nothing more important than another female's belief and understanding, respect and friendship. Fuck yeah, girl. <laughs> Mel B, Scary Spice. Wait, before oh, we finish, okay. we're not finishing. Oh, shit. Because finish I yet. want you to sign your book oh, for me. Oh my God, you're too cute. And get this on camera because she All tried right. to just I slip you her what. book into my bag. I'm like, oh hell no, you're going to sign this for me right now. All right, I tell you what, while I do, I'm going to fire a couple of uh, last, some Spice Girl questions. Okay, go I on. can't interview yeah. you and not talk about of the freaking Spice not. Girl. They're my girls. All right. What does Zigazing R mean? I can't tell you. You're gonna, yeah. That see. is a that is the secret Spice Girls thing. It's a I word that we it. made up. But you know what? You can all interpret it the way you want. I I, I knew that you were gonna say that, but I was like, I still got to ask it already. You know what? It's a, it's a Spice Girls code. We never give up the the respect goods between girl. us five. That's it. I respect that girl. Okay, tour, another album, reunion. Come on. And definitely going to be a reunion at some point. Yes! But I can't t say too much about it. But also, us five have been chatting. We are getting together and we're going to announce something very soon that the fans are going to be, well, they're not going to be disappointed. Let's put it that way. Um, okay, favourite Spice Girl song? That's really hard because we wrote all of the songs, but one song that does actually really pull up my heartstrings is Let Love Lead The Way. Oh. Oh, why does that one pull at your heartstrings? I don't know, just the harmonies on it and the melody and the words, it just, it's very, you know, it's all about pain. It rains mm. and the sunshine, so your life can be like that one time and that, like that, but it's always, you know, you've got to keep the faith. I love that. All right, and then the last one, your favorite Spice Girl memory? Uh, there's so many. Probably one of the funniest ones is when we all went to Maui. It was our first trip when we had a little bit of money in our pockets. And we stayed at the Kealani Hotel, very posh. And we all had like adjoining rooms, but we always ended up in the same room. Um, and then we all pack up, you know, we've been there for, I think it's like 15 days. We've been on hiatus because our number one went to, our, our single went to number one, one in 37 different countries so we're out and out and about promoting it and then it was like right let's get ready to go to the airport we show up at the airport a day early <laughs> and we're like well we can't go back to the hotel so we had to check into this motel 
<laughs> and we, we all ended up in one room with skizzy bedding and we were like, this really is our life, all in the same bed. Because I think it was Mel C being extra organised. We need to get to the airport now! It was daily. <laughs> and then we had the best night. We skinny dipped in the sea, came back to our scuddy little motel. And we were like, oh, because we, you know, we started off with no money. We've got a bit now, but look at us now. In a motel. This is amazing. Motel thing. So Best yeah, that's story. another that's one of the stories that I love. Oh my god. And then you know, we've done a lot of meeting Nelson Mandela, you know, getting to Didn't you still his toilet world. paper? Yeah, because he wouldn't let our hair and makeup come into his house because there was already too many people there. Yeah. And I was like, Don't worry, I'll steal something from, from his house. <laughs> I thought, well, I'm not gonna steal I just thought I'd steal a bit of toilet paper and some plant pebbles. I mean it's not it's not really that that expensive, is it? That, that's fine. And they, I think some of them still have it to this day. Oh my God. And I did tell him, I said, by the way, because since you didn't, didn't let our hair and makeup in there, I've stolen some <laughs> toilet roll and some of your, your plant pebbles. And he went, <laughs> probably thought I was lying. I was like, no, I'm serious. Where can people find you and your amazing freaking book, girl? Oh my God, it's on Amazon. It's at the bookstores. Uh, just get it and educate you. yourself. Where can they follow you? Yeah. Follow me. Do you mean my Instagram? Yeah. Uh, official Mel B. And then what actual website can they go to for the... Um... I don't have a working current website. What's because the website I'm old for school. women though? Oh, it's Women's Aid yeah, women's is my charity that I'm patron of and you've got so much advice and help and support right there. And a helpline that I help fund also. If you want to learn how to thrive after a toxic relationship, stand up for yourself and set boundaries, then keep watching. I think that like, there are some people who can make us feel bad for feeling a certain way and will, or changing our minds, for example. You know, have you ever like been in a conversation where you had previously decided that you wanted to do X, but then a month later you want to do Y and they're like, well, you said you wanted to do X and it's like a whole inconvenience or something. It's like, mm. but I'm allowed to change my mind. You know, that's okay. I didn't know it was okay for me to change my mind for a lot of my life. Um, so I had to learn that skill and I just have to grieve like, okay, I did have 14 years where there was so much that I just didn't think I deserved. And, um, and I, I hold all those 14 years with such like, it, that's my reason for living now is like my purpose. And we are aligned in purpose because you literally have in your thesis, uh, wanting to serve 14 year old girls. Like mm -hmm. I was 14 when that happened to me. So this is like very mind-blowing for me right now but my goal is to help people minimize that amount of time that they don't think they're worthy to yeah go like that that haunts me to think and that's why i'm always every time i'm doing an interview i'm like what is the thing that we can say right now that is going to snap somebody not to necessarily change their life immediately it's never freaking easy it took you 14 years and i assume you're still on the journey oh yeah but like that 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 catalyst mm -hmm. that freaking fire of lighting that match to let somebody know that there's a fire inside of you because it's been dissipated for so many years. Yes, yeah, so the average amount of times it takes a person to leave a, an abusive relationship, do you know how many times it is on average? Oh, God, four? Seven. Oh. So I, I actually uh, recently just went through this with a dear friend who was in a relationship and you kind of watch them go back but you kind of have to just stay on hold and just wait for them to be ready, but she's left now. Mm. But it took... It took a few times and I had to discipline myself and this is where Miley taught me. She was like, you you have to just, just stand strong, no judgment, remind her she has choices. And that's, it's, if you start projecting what you think she should do all the time, making her feel bad about it, she's gonna disappear from your life. Mm -hmm. And so. So that's, that's powerful actually on that, even if you do want someone to help themselves or if you want to help someone, not forcing them, but being there for them. But what about the other side? So you actually mentioned right mm -hmm. at the beginning that you did turn to people in your life and mm -hmm. they basically said like, it's on you. Mm -hmm. um, how do you, <laughs> now looking back, when you were silenced, because I do believe that that's what that was. Yeah. How do you work through that silence? And then how did you, find your voice and what a freaking incredible voice it is. Mm, okay, so I'm gonna say a few things that are a bit unexpected on how to navigate that silencing. So to, I, I think about um, heat and I think about joy. Okay, so I'll start with heat. So 
in my body when I encounter uncomfortable scenarios, I feel a heat. In my life, sometimes when I feel excitement, I feel a heat. I feel these things in my body. And I was trained, after I got sexually assaulted, I, com I became a floating head, right? And I just didn't have a body. I just couldn't even acknowledge that I had a body because it's too much. Um, but then slowly but surely, I started, my body started screaming at me and I would get acid reflux, so that's heat, right? And I, I, I would get like tense knots in my shoulders, I would get migraines, and so my body's communicating with me. And so learning to read my body and the heat and just to ask, I don't need to necessarily know what it is, but just be like, oh, my body's saying something. I think that is one of the very first steps of like helping to reclaim one's voice is to actually reacquaint oneself with our bodies. Um, and so the second thing is, is pleasure and joy. So when, um, when we found out that Roe v. Wade got overturned, a lot, of my, a lot of my girlfriends and I were in mourning. But immediately what we did, we said, let's go on a road trip. And we decided to plan this joyous kind of road trip because we we're like, we can't let these systems take our joy because what, what else do we have? So pleasure and joy, like these actual things of like, they can help us reintegrate with our bodies and remind us like, oh, we, we are full humans that deserve this. So I know that's like a big leap, but little moments of comfort, even like deciding to give myself um, extra time because I used to tutor, I would like, instead of driving straight to my client's place to teach, teach them, I would take the long way so I could go look at the ocean just like gifting myself like that, just starting these little, little gifts. And then eventually I started gifting myself of calling Ellen Doby mm -hmm. and being like, man, I thought you were so cool in college. I just like didn't have the confidence. She even asked me to be her roommate and I said, no. Oh, what? Yeah, so that's what? actually, yes. <laughs> that's even worse. That's even worse. Oh, Isn't that crazy? Oh. The amounts of limitations we put on ourselves like, are, are insane. Like I. I think about like, you know, like it's like Alice in Wonderland, you know, she gets really too big for the house. She grows out mm -hmm. of it. I think about that image all the time. Like I was containing myself mm. in this little box and we're so many people are doing that, like walking around the streets. I'm like, who is actually living their full potential or who's in their boxes right now? You know, I'm always curious mm. about that. Oh, dude, this is so powerful. I'd just like to go back actually to the heat and joy thing yeah. for a second. Because as you were describing, I was like, they're so powerful. And yet sometimes they almost, they seemed a little contradictory. So for instance, whereas like you were saying about Roe versus Wade, like I assume you're, you're freaking pissed and you're mad and you're upset and mm -hmm. you're angry. But that's your body saying it. But you mm -hmm. actually chose to ignore the body's response and choose joy. I chose to. So that's a, I'm so glad you brought that up because, okay, anger, I was taught to, just totally abandon my relationship with anger. Mm -hmm. I'm in my 30s and I'm just reacquainting with what anger is because I was taught situation creates me creates me feeling angry. Immediately hop to reconciliation, forgiveness, compassion. Mm -hmm. so, is that culturally? Is that what you were taught? I think, yeah, maybe I, I wonder, is it culturally? Is it my family? Is it my gender? I don't know, but whatever it is, mm -hmm. the special cocktail of my life has taught me to leapfrog over anger and what it has done and it made me vulnerable to a lot of toxic relationships but now the anger oh i express that anger but i did it through creativity mm. so i think it's important for especially women and also just like any people who have felt like oppressed like the lgbtq community like people of color it's there there's this importance for us to acknowledge anger Anger is a really good, like, it's like a, if you look at a lighter, it's like that spark. Mm. If we keep sparking, it's going to burn us. But if you let the anger just spark and tell you information, then you can take that energy and then put it into something constructive. Mm. So angry song. So I wrote, um, we won't go back. And I ended up opening it to my fan base and saying like, a lot of us feel powerless right now, but can you write some lyrics and write this song with me? So my fans wrote a song with me because again, choice. I have a choice. I'm going to choose what lyric I want to use to express how pissed I am, but it's not like this sense of anger to, to damage my own body. Mm. 
is something that I put into art. That's why art is so powerful. Is like we can construct it into here. It doesn't harm anyone, and it actually makes something new.、Mm. And it actually then can connect to me with someone else. Ah,、oh, that's so freaking powerful.、Um, I love your art. And then as you talk about using that for、um, almost your your healing. And you were talking, you were telling me just before we started rolling that you were practicing on the guitar during COVID, and just like one chord at a time. And that idea, from a mindset standpoint, is exactly like that. Is literally the thing that people need to do, in my belief, in to make a change.、Mm-hmm. Right? Everyone thinks it has to be this a whole overhaul or、mm-hmm. you know、um, perfection, but that one little drip every single day. And I heard you say like one step towards bravery,、um, and you gave an example in an interview I had where you said like even being brave, just saying you know what I actually don't like that restaurant we go to every day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like tell me about that because again, when I go to the tools that people can use as they're listening,、mm-hmm. these little tools of finding bravery to find your voice to speak up to leave that relationship or whatever it is. When people don't believe they can, if they th- have the insecurity or they're not confident, how do they start?、Mm. Just telling someone to start doesn't help. Right, right. I I would say it starts with noticing, just like noticing, like okay, when am I actually not speaking my truth? It could be like the bar- barista spells your name incorrectly on the cup. <laughs>、yeah. You're like, okay, I'll let that go. And then your boss like pronounces your cousin's name incorrectly. Okay, I'll let that go. Like, th- what what little things are we letting go? Just noticing and not judging. Like that's the that's the part where it's like, please don't judge yourself. Just notice it because it becomes information.、Mm-hmm. It's okay. We all do it. I still do it, and I have to catch myself. But there are times where like. I will I will go out of my way to like correct something, but do it out of my own style. Like we can all create our own style, you know. Like we talk about fashion. Like okay, what are we gonna wear? What colors do I like? What kind of materials look good on me? What cuts look good on me? It's like, what kinds of words feel good coming out of my mouth、mm-hmm. when I have a confrontation? Like,、uh, so I we can design phrases. It'll be like, hey, I know it's like not the f- most fun to talk about. Like that was a phrase I used. So I was like, it's not the most fun to talk about, but I need to talk to you about something. I started developing these like. It's just developing vocabulary slowly but surely, like how I learned the guitar, where I learned one chord a week. That's it, one chord a week. I think the gift of learning music has taught me. All my music teachers, every music teacher, always says, "Slow down, slow,、mm. slow, slow down." Everybody wants to be able to play the concerto or play that rock song, but it's like. You gotta slow it down and just play one chord at a time. So in our lives, if we're trying to become braver, it's like. Just allow yourself to just notice, and then、uh, give yourself time. If the barista spells your, spells your name wrong, maybe you practice there and be like, "Oh, actually, it's two ends and not one." Maybe you got a little nervous, you know. Maybe it was a little more time, but but then like the relationship with the self starts getting affirmed, you know, and it feels so good. Like okay, because eventually we can start trusting ourselves again, and that was something I lost when I was in an abusive relationship. When I got out, I was like, "How do I trust myself? I let myself get into this position. So, what what was it about me that got me into this position? And then my relationship with self was just so decimated. And then with these little acts, it's like I'm. It's almost like I'm courting myself again. No, I like learning、that. to fall in love with myself again and building a relationship. And I think recently I'm starting to get a place where like, we're we're buddies. Like I'll be hanging out with myself. I'm like. Hey, buddy. You know, <laughs>、yeah. I have on my alarm clock. Um, um, I put you can put titles on your alarms, right?、Yeah. And I put "Good morning, bestie,"、oh. <laughs> and it's like the smallest little thing, but it helps me.、Uh, I chuckle to myself. I'm like, oh my god, I'm such a nerd, and also, I am my bestie. Like, I'm my bestie. I love that so much because honestly, I'm such a like. I have such a thirst for tactics and tips that、mm. I can use in my life because. I have a cycle, so there are days where I feel really shitty. There are days that I feel very happy. I feel overwhelmed sometimes.、Mm-hmm. I get hangry, right? So like, <laughs> so like, these are all real things that, as women, as women, as people, we just have to deal with all the freaking time. Yeah. And so when you have to deal with these situations where maybe you're not showing up as your best self, what are the tactics you can do or use to implement in your life so that you can improve? And so what are those tactics? Those small little things、mm-hmm. instead of the big go meditate for hours,、yeah. go to a retreat. <laughs> Got the time for that, yeah. But the thing that you're talking about, 
are the things that I think people can listen, who listen right now can actually implement in their lives on a daily. Yeah, you know, the other thing I've done is I have an album. You know, you, we can make albums in our phones. Um, and so I, I screenshot messages from fans, mm -hmm. but it could be text messages from family, friends that are just encouraging. I screenshot them and I put it into an encouragement album. And so that I can go into it when I'm feeling low, like I can go and just be like, okay, I'm not alone. Like people do care about me. I'm not like, like cause that's very important is like when we start ma having the illusion that we don't matter and it doesn't matter, then that's when things can get really scary. And I know that feeling. So I like to have these things that tether me back and be like, okay, no, you know, Melissa liked that song or, you know, just, just little things like that. That's, um, and breathing breathing like daily for me just I, like meditation there are times where i did like consistent meditation 10 minutes every day and there's been phases where I, i've fallen off but i do just like even a couple breaths and i say to myself so hum which is i am mm -hmm. in, in sanskrit and so that helps me i am i am i just am i am happy i am sad i am stressed i'm just i am and then just a, a couple deep breaths. And I do that with my audiences too. When I play, it's really selfishly for me because I'm like feeling all this energy, but I have my audience take a deep breath with me and it's the best feeling ever. Just one deep breath. It's great. Oh, I love that so much. And speaking of I am, I heard you say that you actually put um, your songs into three buckets. I am, I can't, and I want. Mm, Break nice. those down for me, homie, because that was so beautiful. And again, everything you talk about is so on point for mindset on anything people are struggling with. Yeah, yeah. So it's so interesting. I, if I were to take a bird's eye view and look at my writing career in the beginning, um, like as I started becoming professional, I noticed that a lot of my songs were the, the songs that I won't, I can't, I don't belong to you, all these things, because I had to establish, I was trying desperately to establish my own space. It's like, mm. you know, like building a garden. It's like, okay, do we, maybe we do have to put a little fence up. So, you know, the cute rabbits don't get to our lettuce, you know, like things like that. So I had to create boundary songs, but without, without singing, I can't, I, I, I couldn't really think about like what I want. And that's the next step. Like, what do I want? You know, cause some, there was a writer that like said, he's like, Oh, I really want you to write your I am song. And I was like, Oh man, I don't even know if I can write my I am song yet because I haven't spent enough time thinking about my I want songs. You know, what do I want? I don't know. Like, do I want to go to Arizona and like climb the Red Rocks or do I, I don't know, want to go to Manhattan and be in the city? Am I a city girl? Am I a country girl? Like, I don't know. So I had to explore the I wants. And I want is a really energizing and magnetic place to be. The more I think about what I want and talk and, and pursue what I want, the more I attract those similar people who are doing the same thing. And it's so generative. It's so creative. Um, the I can't was very important for me. And it also helped me to connect with people who are also learning to defend themselves, to protect their time and just say enough is enough, which is very important too. Mm -hmm. I think now I'm starting to integrate all of the sides and just be fully integrated, like joyfully full. And I think that's the maturity of a songwriter um, and maybe artist and maybe as a woman too, it's like, okay, there's going to be days that I know what I want. There's going to be days I know what I don't want. And there's going to be days that I know who I am. And there's going to be days where I don't want to know who I am. And I just want to be a blank slate and like fig and just let life teach me, you know? Uh, so strong. So if someone was listening, if they let assume they're not a songwriter, but um, what order would they put that in them? Would it be, I can't, I want, I am? Is that the right order? Yeah, I can't. I want, I am. That was for me. And maybe some other people lived a certain way and the order is switched around. But for me, I, I couldn't even think about what I wanted until I set the boundaries. Yeah, it's fascinating because as I was, so I can't is very strong because I think that once you start to dig in deep of like, the things that are painful, you even said earlier, right? Like, how does this make you feel? So I think that that feeling, normally it's like, oh, this doesn't feel good. So you can start to identify all the things that don't feel good and then assign those to the I can't. But I found very interesting that you put the I want before I am, because I would think in my head before I heard your explanation that 
well, you can't necessarily know what you want in the future if you don't know who you are today. Mm. But actually, your way is super freaking genius because what you're saying is, well, just desire. What are the things that make your heart sing? And now actually that tells you something about yourself that you yes. may not be able to identify. Yes. Because pleasure and joy, um, desire, those are all great compasses to, to guide us. And I think when I think about social change, there are things that are difficult to talk about and there's also the tools of joy and pleasure and desire. And when we frame things that way, oh, I want a world where, you know, everyone has access to the same books. That's much more energizing than fighting against some, you know, a, a force that's trying to keep books out of schools. Mm. Like focusing on the wants and the positives, we can attract people on the same vision and then we can head there together. Mm. I love that. It's kind of like, I mean, you know how to do that because you've run, you've run businesses. It's like having a, having a consolidated vision that everyone can go to. It's like once that vision is clear and everyone's on the same page of going there, it's like nothing, nothing can, can get in the way. You know? Yes, but I think it's easier in business because you don't have your own emotions wrapped up in it. Mm. You don't have the belief system of that you're not good enough. It's like yeah. your business doesn't give a shit if you're good enough or not. Either you do or you don't, right? right? Either you show up and you figure out the problem or you don't. And so if you don't believe you're good enough, the business doesn't care. So, but with yourself, it's mm. a very different game, which is why I always love to talk mm. about mindset because the business side of things to me can be binary. Right. But when you That's set a insightful. goal with your heart, right, I want to do this. I want this joy. And then all the flooding comes in of your belief system, of the expectations that maybe you've had when you were a child. Me being Greek Orthodox, right? You can't marry a guy who's not Greek Orthodox, right? Mm -hmm. You can't leave your country. You can't say, you know, no to your dad. All these expectations may have kept me exactly there. Even if I had said my goal was to marry this amazing man and move to America, so I'd actually love to talk about um, the expectations you have had set on your life. Um, obviously, being such an incredibly successful singer, um, I assume as a kid that you weren't necessarily, people weren't like, yes, you're going to be an amazing singer. Um, talk to me about the expectations that your family set on you and then how you broke free. Because the breaking free is, I think, the very important part. Um, and then if you don't mind also discussing your husband and your family dynamic. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Um, so... Um, my family, uh, came from extreme poverty. My, my, my mom and dad have seen it all. Like they both have seen poverty and then they've seen great success and they've also seen everything in the middle. And so my parents' desire is for me to be safe and to be, to be okay. And so that's the foundation of all of it. All of it, of course, comes from love and their own experience. And I think me pursuing a profession that is based on art was just like mind blowing to them. They're like, w no, like you need to do something with skills that can help people and that there, there will always be a demand for it. Mm -hmm. Like get into law, get into medicine, you know? And I remember my dad, I don't know if he'll remember this, but I remember distinctly in our living room, he looked at me one time, he's like, you know, Connie, there are some people in this world that are so, they see the world so differently that they end up deciding to live outside of the structure. And he was like, don't become that. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and I was like, okay, dad. Like I was just hanging out, but it stuck with me because I was like, is he saying I am that? Um, and I, I think probably, I think, I think he noticed that I looked at the world differently and that worried him. Mm -hmm. um, so I went to UC Berkeley. I, I, I was supposed to go to med school and I was going to think I was thinking of doing law school, but I could feel again, this is the gift of my body. I'm so grateful. My body has led and taught me through like through so many things because my body would make me fall asleep when I'd studied for like law tests like the LSAT. And my body would show me like if I'm in the studio, I could go for 18 hours straight. Uh -huh. And I was like, oh, interesting. So I do like working. It's just a specific type of work. Um, so when I followed that, it was hard. It was hard. Um, it caused like some rifts. I've, I've always been the one that causes like some rifts within the family. Um, not causes, but like I initiate these, these confrontations of dynamic. Is that um, because you're going against the grain? Yes, I'm going against the grain. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so I think... 
I think even now, the way I want to live my life and stuff is still something that my parents don't fully understand, but I know there's deep, deep love and desire to understand the journey to getting there is just, I have to learn how to not want to change them mm. um, because that's what I wish for myself, right? I wish for my parents to not want to change me. So I need to just fully not want to change them either. And that's okay that they see me in a certain way. And it's kind of changed the game. Once I stopped like defending my stance and just being like, okay, that's what you feel and I love you anyway, it's changed everything. Now now there's more questions of like, okay, who is this, who is this daughter we have? Because I'm no longer chasing I'm going to attract. I'm in the, I'm, I say it every day, actually. Maybe that's my new mantra is like, I'm in the age of attracting, not chasing. Mm, I love that. Now, I've got a difficult question for you. Please. Yeah. What do you think they would be like if you weren't successful? I think there'd be a lot more conversations about me considering a more realistic job of waking up, um, I mean, that still comes up sometimes, you know? Really? <laughs> like, I can't give up this music stuff. <laughs> I think they, they've let it go. I think I made the, I think I passed the mark like a couple years ago and I've, I've been safe of those comments. Um, they, they, I, my, my mom and my dad did say to me like recently, they're very impressed with my resilience, like my persistence, mm. like, and I, I have zero complaints about my, my profession. It's really hard but I'm never bored and I love it. Like I'm always learning and I feel very much alive and engaged and challenged. Mm. Um, so my, my mom acknowledged that. She's like, I never hear one complaint from you about your journey and you're still doing it. So I don't know. You're on your way to a hot date. You've got your sexy pants on and you feel great. You eat the bread, you drink some wine, just living your freaking best life. When suddenly, uh oh, stomach pain starts to strike. Guys, I freaking get it. I've literally felt your pain. Like literally, stomach cramps, bloating, gas, discomfort. These are all freaking signs that your gut is saying something isn't right and your confidence takes a freaking nosedive. But thankfully, we can fix a lot of these issues, guys, with today's sponsor, Viome, and their simple at-home gut health test. Simply collect and ship your sample and you'll get results in two to three weeks via the app. See your 20 integrative health scores that foods are good and bad for your biome and so much more. My homie, don't let an imbalanced gut keep you from feeling like a badass. Viome is offering $110 off your test right now. Take control of your health today with Viome. That's so cool. The reason why I ask is because the success isn't guaranteed. It isn't. Right? But the journey and the struggle is. And so anytime mm -hmm. that you're going to go against the grain with your family or expectations that you have, um, it's going to be difficult. And I don't want to pretend that it, oh, oh, it magically goes away once you mm -hmm. get older. And so, um, you know, me too, where my husband white guy from Tacoma goes to visit my Greek father to ask for his blessing to marry me, um, to marry me. My dad said no. And so the, the past 20 years have been to prove my father that Tom was right and that he could take care of me, quote unquote. Now, the thing is, is that we've now been married for 20 years and we have had a successful company. We have. <laughs> so the, the, the result is like, oh my God, my dad loves Tom now more than me. And every time I call him, he's like, how's Tom? Right? Like that's actually true. But it's through the success of the marriage. It's through the success of having built a business together. But what if I did get divorced after five years? Mm -hmm. And I w don't want people to just stop only if it's going to be successful. Mm -hmm. Even if my marriage had failed five years in, I think it's important to remind yourself that you don't live for other people, that you tried it. You believe that that was the right chance to take and it didn't come into fruition and that's okay. Yeah. And so they're like the same thing with you is that I hear your parents like maybe are being okay now, but how much of that is in hindsight because you've done well. And so how do we say st stay strong in moments when they keep coming back to you? I mean, I still get my dad, probably not anymore, but he, even when I told him I didn't want children, he was, he's still, still, when I said, dad, we've chosen not to have kids, but being Greek Orthodox, he couldn't imagine a world that a woman would choose to not have right. children. So he would still ask me, even though I said I wasn't going to have any. 
So the constant pressures of family. Yes. Um, I was just wondering how you navigate those even as an adult. Well, first of all, thank you for modeling your authentic life. Because again, it shows me what is possible mm -hmm. and like makes the environment so wonderful for everyone else to just choose whatever they want, which mm -hmm. is what I think nature intended is for all of us to just do what we desire, of course, with love uh, mm -hmm. and care. Um, one of the things that has taught me the most in my life is my Tom. Yeah, you, <laughs> so I was you like listening to your well. your podcast about like your dad not accepting your Tom. I was like, wait, I know that exact story. <laughs> my dad also doesn't like, accept your yeah, Tom. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we're still in process, so I'll be mindful of how I share the story, but because I want to respect my parents and their process, and I also cannot any longer silence my love for Tom and our relationship. I actually felt very, we've been together four years and if people were to look at my socials, I'm just really starting to lean in because I was navigating so many different opinions all around me from Tom to my, my family, mostly like the, my family and um, I couldn't hear my voice anymore. And so Recently, I just was like, I need I need everyone to just give me space to figure out what I want and on what terms. And when I say that, it's about how do I want my family to now meet my partner after four years of not meeting him? What are the dynamics? What are the questions that I'm going to be OK with them asking him? Like, I'm protective of Tom. I'm prote I'm protective of this beautiful relationship we have. And I I. I, so I'm trying to figure out those dynamics. And I actually went on tour with Abby Wambach and Glennon Doyle oh. on the Together Live tour. And I had fallen in love with Tom as Abby and Glennon were really pronouncing their love for each other in public. And so they were really encouraging to me about really just leaning into my heart and following that. Um, but falling in love with Tom and then having my family not be able to fully accept him. And they're getting ready to open the doors of talking to him. And so I'm trying to understand what I want. So that'll be a whole journey for me is like, what are my boundaries? But this process has taught me like to completely choose me and my path at the cost of disappointing my mom, my dad, my whole like family, and even maybe being judged or from the outside, like the you know, even accepting maybe they talk about our relationship outside of me knowing and maybe not talking about it well, like that's heartbreaking, but also so strengthening. Ooh, what so, do you mean by that? How is that strengthening? So it's strengthening because I have to live with that and I still have to find joy every day. Mm -hmm. I still got to write my songs, still got to run my business, but to be able to walk forwards and to do this crazy thing of trying to love them regardless and accept them and be okay with it and love active actively love through action um, ritual and showing up anyway when they don't accept all of me and I don't recommend this for everyone because I know there are some people who've told me like they're like my presence is a gift I'm cutting it out if they can't accept mm. I also am navigating cultural lines that I'm not sure I'm like is this my culture that is making this really hard or is this just my family I don't know and so the only way I can or both the only way I can figure out is actually engaging and showing up which takes more calories takes more time and energy but I find it worth it for me to look into it and so I'm all working with my therapist on how much do I go there and give and and um how much do I protect? And so it's like this constant dance and it's like the music industry. You never really know where you stand and it's kind of like stressful and, but also wonderful and filled with emotion and richness. And so I just, I guess I'm used to doing this like dance a bit. And that's why I think my practice with joy and my friendships are so deep is because I know what it feels like to have conditional acceptance, like what you're talking about, like what if your marriage, like what if you you two weren't financially successful? Like what mm. would that look like? Like, And so I approach my friendships with this unconditional love that I hungered for and hunger for, but I get it from my friends now, mm. my chosen family, and I get it with Tom, like really practicing that. I feel like not not receiving that acceptance has given me the gift of compassion 
um, because I can see it when other people don't have it. I want them to be seen and heard. And can you accept it now because you've built so much confidence within yourself over time? Because I could imagine if you don't feel good about yourself, you don't, you have like tremendous insecurity. Doing what you just said would be almost like crippling if somebody rejects you. I think that's a really, really good point you brought up. I'm glad you brought it up because that is like a key point. My confidence, I think my confidence built through my relationship with my art, my music. Mm. Songwriting is like a direct like thermometer of my wellness like when I'm really well and in my life in my flow my music becomes pretty clear like in my relationship with how often I sit down to write how often mm -hmm. I'm um, working on my craft like like uh, I, I view songwriting like a devotional it's almost like a daily prayer that I, I go to um, and because I've developed such a tight relationship my songwriting is my homie <laughs> Um, because because I've developed such a strong homey relationship with my art, I have faith in myself that I can take care of me. So I didn't have that faith in myself before, but then through this creative process, I've developed it. So I think we can write ourselves into existence. Like if we don't see it here, we can write it down. We can write the idea. Like you're writing stories, right? You're writing these beautiful stories into existence and it, it affects reality. Mm, I love that. And it becomes this like, almost like reinforcing loop. So it's like you do the hard thing. Oh, I did the hard thing. You get into another situation, maybe you don't believe in yourself, but you remind yourself that you did the hard thing and now it becomes easier. And there's one story actually that I've heard of yours that I'd love for you to talk about, which I was thinking about how much you go back to this story as the thing, because so many of us has this, have this. So like the imposter syndrome of feeling like, oh, you don't belong. I, you know, am I good enough? Should I really be here? And I believe you're doing this recording session with like this incredible artist Mm -hmm. and you have like other imposter syndrome and you make an excuse to go to the toilet <laughs> the toilet is a is a sacred place where we go Dude, I'm so for refuge you. A thousand percent. i even literally joke no joke i actually say to people if you're in a situation where you're going to either feel embarrassed or overwhelmed or frustrated mm -hmm. or lash out go to the toilet and i don't encourage people to lie except for this moment and i'm like if you have to say you've got an upset stomach and you have to run to the toilet just to get out of that bloody situation freaking lie but i'm with you the toilet is like the sanctuary so it really is and it's kind of symbolic right because it's all the things like we want to we want to like hide it's kind of like Ugh. but it's actually where the truth is you know the truthiest truth um um yeah so um I was, I, I'll say the producer's name, his, in the, uh, Raphael Sadiq. I was in his studio and I've looked up to him. I've loved his music for years and I, I was just so nervous. And I was like, I need to use the restroom. And I went into the restroom and I, my heart was racing. I was like, oh my gosh, Connie, stop. Like you've been like doing this professionally for years now. Like he's just a guy that's also very talented and like very established and also like <laughs> made some of my favorite songs. And, and so I was like, okay you got to create something to trick your brain. So then I started singing to myself, Ooh, I belong, Ooh, I belong here. And it ended up becoming like a, a whole song um, uh, that I ended up using to kind of like empower the AAPI community during that really intense period of violence against our community. Um, um, but yeah, in, in that bathroom, I was able to remind myself, oh, I can trick my brain <laughs> with these mantras. Mantras work like a charm for me. Mm -hmm. Like they really help me. Um, like lately I've been, I've been telling myself, so that, um, in addition to the, I'm no longer chasing, I'm attracting the other mantra I have right now is I am sovereign and I am safe mm -hmm. because even years after being in an abusive relationship, I still have high anxiety. And sometimes like everything will be fine. Like the house is fine. The weather's beautiful outside. I paid my rent, paid my bills. Like I have a boyfriend, like I'm so happy, like, but I still have this anxiety and it's like almost this echo from the past. And so I have to tell myself I am sovereign and I am safe. And I have to remind myself, I have to do it every day because that anxiety comes up all the time. Are you finding it actually more now, now that you have, oh, I'm paying the bills. Oh, I have a good relationship. Oh, I have a roof. <laughs> like, do you almost find it like more? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you relate to, like, 
Yeah, I think it becomes a, like everything feels so beautiful now and you don't want to lose it. And the thing that actually helped me, I don't know if you've heard the quote, this too shall pass, mm -hmm. the Taoist quote. I love that so much. Oh, and I used to always use it whenever I was down. Right. Don't worry, Lisa. This too shall pass. Now I start using it for the great as well, yes. because I think as humans, yes. we hit these amazing moments. And mm -hmm. then for some reason, we convince ourselves that that should be our base level. And so now our highest moments become our base. Well, there's, only, there's nowhere to go but down. <laughs> so what I remind myself in moments of beauty, I'm like, this too shall pass. And that isn't to bum me out. It's to actually just make sure I enjoy the moment because yeah. life is ups and downs by definition. Yes. So shit is going to hit the fan. It's it not will about if it's about it's when, when. Mm -hmm. so 100% agree like um Brooke Castillo is like this amazing um life coach and she says if you are going to pursue your dreams you have to 100% accept that you are going to feel shame you are going mm -hmm. to feel like if you want to dodge it you're not going to pierce through like you have to accept that that's going to be a thing that's okay once I accept that it's easier. The, the, that's exactly what the I think the this too shall pass does to me. It's just the acceptance yeah. of that. It's not always going to be like this. Why do you think it will be? You know, and now when something happens, it's not like that. See, I knew this was too good to be true. And it's like people say that a lot. And mm. I just think enjoy each moment for what it is, because life is about that. Like if we can just accept that. it and just because otherwise you're just going to die trying. Like, yeah. It's just going to be exhausting to try and battle or to hold on to what you think is like the pinnacle of your life. Well said. I really love how you flip that. I'm going to use that actually because I'm, I'm reaching some really special moments in my career and I'm going to hold this two shall pass mm. because and, and it be as a beautiful thing. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Ooh, of it's a good tool. So what are you doing right now when you have that anxiety? I do, um, so there's something called energy medicine, which is like tapping. Oh, tapping, um, yeah. I love tapping because I'm such a physical human. Um, and I real I used to think I wasn't because of my abuse. I thought I was just a floating head, but I was like, oh my God, my body's really loud. I, I'm really grateful my body gives me a lot of information. So I do a lot of tapping um, and I do breath work. Breath work is really mm -hmm. like just even just breathing deep for 30 minutes, like guided online, just finding something that's, that's pretty economical. There's like a lot of great breathwork teachers and stuff. Um, but also just walking outside, just feeling the wind on my skin because we're indoors so much that like sometimes when I go outside, I feel the wind on my skin. I'm like, okay, I'm alive and looking up at the sky, literally just simple, simple acts like that just bring me all the way back so that I can um, re-engage. And I really like using heat uh workouts to energize myself so like you know that 2 p.m slump like i'll do 10 push-ups in the studio and i'm like kind of back um so it really helps me i like i like utilizing gravity and my body weight to like leverage the energy that i need because it's all there at our fingertips we think we're tired and we'll, we should just rest but actually when we're tired sometimes if we do some jumping jacks it just like immediately like re-energizes us so that helps me to stay really grounded through all the ups and downs of the career. And coming from someone where you just said, like you start that sentence with like, I used to be completely numb from the head down or like a floating head. <laughs> yeah. And then be able to talk about like the wind on your skin. Like that's so freaking beautiful. And I really hope people mm. notice that one sentence that you just said of how like it just shows and encompasses your evolution. Um, because that's what mm. like, I'm gonna go back to like, when someone can just believe Right. That's the first step. Just believe that where they are now won't dictate the rest of their life. And so to hear you talk in one sentence to go from I'm, I was a floating head and now I can feel wind on my skin. <laughs> is such an amazing. That's true. Yeah. Thanks for pointing that out. I think like it all started for me with a like audacious question. Like, do I deserve more? Question mark. You know, like, is this all? Is this it? Like me just getting in my own way and just thinking I don't deserve things or could I think otherwise? Because I would have well-meaning teachers be like, what is your biggest vision in life? I'd be like, I can't even think big because I, I'm i struggling yeah. with my imagination because I don't feel like I deserve it. So then the question is like, do I deserve more? And that's a question. And I've always told, I've always loved questions. Mm. I think questions are the key to a more interesting life. Like the more we shape our questions, like 
we can open crazy doors, crazy conversations. Like, oh, right, so what if someone asks themselves, "Do I deserve more?" But they answer it no. Oh, then my heart breaks. My heart breaks. Like, would you re re ask a question? Like, would you repeat a different question to get to a yes? Yes, I think that's really wise.、Um, like, for example, there's this woman. She said, "Yeah, it's like simplifying the questions." Like. Um, um, like she, she, this is like a different thing, but she was basically like, "Okay, I can't say that I love my body right now, but I can say I have a body." Oh, you know, starting there,、mm. like ground zero,、yeah. you know.、Um, but for a question, if I was like, "Do I deserve more?" Maybe it could be like, "Do I feel? Do I feel a restlessness right now?"、Mm. Do I feel this? Energy in me that's like I, I need to find an outlet. Maybe it's that you know. Maybe it's about what is right now instead of what could be.、Mm. What could be feels like a little later in the game if we're still healing now. You、yeah. know. All right. Well, how do you then have build your belief system like you have right? Where you were young, you're like, I'm gonna sing, I'm gonna do this. You get a record deal with Atlantic Records. It's like I believe you're the first Asian. Is that correct?、The、one of the、female? one of the first.、Uh, there's、Asian? a there's a collection of them. I actually don't know. I don't know. But you're but, one of yeah, the very one of the first, which is just、mm-hmm. freaking amazing. And then during your career, you decide to leave. Talk to me about that. Where you have a belief, you fight through, you push through your family, the non-believers. You go hard. You practice. You practice. You get up every day to be to be the best. The dream comes true, and then you realize maybe down the line, oh, this doesn't fit or align with who I am now. How the hell do you make that pivot? Because so many people, because they've told themselves that story, you're、mm-hmm. going to get the record deal. You're going to get the record deal. They'll stay in that record deal、mm-hmm. for ten, twenty years,、mm-hmm. miserable, but、mm-hmm. they'll stay there because their belief system told them, "Well, hang on a minute, you've battled your family, you can't turn around and change now." I felt like I was constantly like taking myself hostage. I, I, I'll explain. I signed the deal, then my brain takes myself hostage, be like, "Oh, you can't lose this deal. Don't lose this deal. Don't lose this deal." Like, you don't want to be an artist has has to leave the deal, and so、uh, and then.、Um, I would go and accomplish another thing, and then my brain would take me hostage. Another way is like, well, you got to do it again. You got to do something great because you're gonna be a one-hit wonder. But whatever. And then I was like, I was like, I don't like operating in this way because people would say like, are you doing things out of fear? Or are you doing things out of like love and intention and vision? I was like, it's definitely fear. I'm holding myself hostage, and I was like, I want to free myself. That was one thing. Is like, I need to, I need to face the thing that I'm running from, so that I can actually focus on what matters. Because if I'm spending all this time being scared that I'm going to lose this deal, like it's going to just, it's, I'm going to create a situation that way.、Mm-hmm. And what I realize is like, in order to keep this deal, I need to be able to communicate with authority, with confidence, and with clarity on what I need and what I want. And at that point in my life. I knew I didn't have the tools yet, and so I had to leave, and feel the feel that feel the risk of that because I I do really well when I'm when I'm like when there's risk when there's like I I just do well with like high stakes situations,、um, and so I I kind of was like I'm gonna let myself feel this loss, and 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 mourn and grieve this dream I used to have. This is this is、mm-hmm. me. Going to my teenager self and being like, "You thought this was the way, but it's not, and that's okay. And I for and that's okay. We're just gonna find a new way, and it's gonna be even better because I realized my personality, my interests didn't fit into what the company needed, and I also didn't have the tools to maneuver it. So I had to leave, or else I was gonna disappear. And as a creative, it sounds like you were being originally then driven by the fear, right? You were moving, like you were moving away from fear every time to try and get something better, and so you, fear was chasing you. But now it seems like you're chasing creativity, attracting, attracting, exactly. Oh yeah, you're right.、From、Not chasing, chasing to you're attracting. attracting. Yes, yeah. And I think because I went viral, that there's a psychology that happens when when I enter into the market and they know I've gotten something viral, they want to chase that moment.、Mm-hmm. So a lot of chasing came into my consciousness because I was on the street, it went viral. I'm just experiencing it, and then a company was like, "We gotta, we gotta leverage this moment, right?" And so then chasing became part of it. And I remember thinking a couple times, I was like, "Is this right? Like, do we need to be chasing?"、Mm-hmm. 
you know, but then it became this thing that just, it was a beast bigger than me. Mm. You know, I'm just, the, I feel like record labels are like a big, beautiful machine. And then there's an artist, the artist is the microchip. You put the microchip with the vision, the ideas, the songs, and then it can make the robot move. Mm. But I needed more time to work on my microchip. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? And there's some artists who like already have their microchip ready and they're just like, bloop, and they're just like, they do well. Like Lizzo is doing so beautifully with with that partnership. And I, I don't know everything behind the scenes, of course, but mm -hmm. there are some artists who are just ready for that. And I knew I wasn't and I had to leave to figure it out. And so now my priority is my relationship with my art and my music and learning how to communicate. My voice is my everything. Like this, I was put on this earth to honor my voice. And if I don't know how yet still to tell a producer, I don't like those beats, I wanna change it to this drum pattern, that's my priority. You know what I mean? That's what is value to, about valuable to me. And I, I, I got into situations when I was in the system where I would even like, I haven't really shared this publicly, but I would, I was in um, the studio with a really, really well-known producer and I was pretty intimidated. We made great stuff together, but I was also really uncomfortable. So I would drink like so much whiskey. I would bring handles of whiskey and drink half of it each time because I was numbing myself of the discomfort being in this fancy place and and then me not being able to produce because I'm a producer and me being the artist and just sitting and watching someone else control my music. It was really tortuous. So if you were to do that again now, what would you do? I would, if I were to do it again, I love that question because it's because I'm ready to answer it. Maybe l like last month I'd be like, I don't know. But now I would, I would take the song we wrote, I would ask for all the files, I would produce it out myself and I would come back with my laptop and be like, okay, can you help me make this better? Because I need it, I need my hands in the music. It's easier for me to work on the music because I know how to than to talk about it and tell someone how to do it. But I'm learning to do both because I want to be adept and that's part of using my voice too. Mm. But yeah, yeah, like as you were talking, I was thinking that that would be, you'd have to A, be willing to let go of things and not always have to be in control because I assume as a producer, that's basically you're the person in control, right? And so now yeah. handing it over and trusting somebody else mm -hmm. can be very hard, especially if you've gone through so much to be there, right? And it's like, now you're putting your trust in essence in somebody else. And if you have trust issues, now that probably compiles it, which, mm -hmm. you know, no surprise. And then the other side of it is, is trusting that you actually can do it and trusting in yourself, that creativity, yes. that you can walk away, you can t do it on your own and then you can come back and make demands, mm -hmm. beautiful demands, but still make demands is huge. Huge, huge. So past me walked into studio and just read the environment because this is also a survival skill of being mm. in an abusive relationship. Walk into the room, scan the environment. What do you need to become to make peace with the whole situation? So now walk into the studio, state what I need and what is going to help me flourish so that everyone wins. It saves everybody time. It's more fun. I'm more engaged. Um, so Metamorphosis, that song, I just released a song mm, called Metamorphosis. It's so good. Thank you. And so that I had other producers work on and I, my hands weren't on it. I was like, I can't do what I did at Atlantic. So mm -hmm. I rented out a studio, I produced it myself and then brought it to one of my friends who helped me like just just tie everything up. And I was like, this is, this is a really cool process. Every song's gonna be different, so there's no right answer, yeah. but it's, it's the act of what I said before is walk into the room and state and, and share what I need. And if I'm not getting what I need, ask for it and trust that it could come. Because that's what I think also gets lost in being a survivor is that we lose the trust that what we need can arrive. And then you listen to other people, yeah. And we, we even lose the faith of even asking people because we don't think it's gonna come. Ooh. So how, yeah. do, how have you then, because obviously we've spoken about how you've worked through your mindset, but what about in those moments where let's say you have asked for help or you have reached out to somebody now as an adult and you get rejection? How do you handle that and not make it about you? Oh, yeah. Um, I think I've had the gift of being, because of the experience that I had with Quiet 
and getting to a place where I got so busy, people would ask me stuff for me to do stuff and I would like lose track or something. And so I'd ask them, please like message me until like you hear from me. If I don't reply, I'm, I, I so apologize. I'm just like, I'm barely keeping up. So I kind of hold that example in my head. If I don't hear back from someone, I, I, I'm really working on giving people the benefit of the doubt. That's what me and my team are doing in our business. We're like, mm -hmm. everybody makes mistakes. Let's give each other the benefit of the doubt. Let's just like assume the best out of people and, and not write these stories because we're very creative people. <laughs> we like to write scenarios and I've done many a scenario. I've written many a scenario that isn't true. Oh God, how many of us have? <laughs> So yeah. to, what's interesting is I used to do that all the time. And then I realized I'm actually missing a piece. I'm doing it to self-soothe my ego because again, being rejected or getting a note stings. Mm -hmm. And so I kept saying, well, you don't know, don't make up a story, Lisa. It's not about you. But then I realized, oh, actually, sometimes it is about me. Mm. And I'm, I think, putting on mm. blinders by pretending it's not always about, not always about me, if you know mm -hmm. what I mean. Yes. So for instance, I reached out to a guest once. Um, she's a good friend of mine now, so I can say Maria Menounos, the e-host. E yeah. So she, I used to be obsessed with her. She was Greek. She lived in America. Like, that was the thing. And I heard she was doing interviews. And so I reached, my team reached out, and she said no. And so in that moment, I, I was like, oh, it's not about you. And I was like, hang on a minute. What if it is about me? Why do I deserve a yes? Maybe I'm not good enough yet. I love this. And I was like, there's a healthy thought and there's an unhealthy thought, right? Mm -hmm. The unhealthy thought, um, if I told myself that and I was insecure, I think that would have been unhealthy for me. But I'm actually quite secure now in just having developed so many years of skills and how do I show up to be, you know, in my own, to really feel worthy. Um, and so in that moment, I was like, but why do I deserve a yes? If I haven't put in the reps, if Oprah reached out to Maria, do you think she, Maria would have said yes or no? Maria probably would have said yes. Mm -hmm. So it is about me. Mm, okay. Yes. Let's talk about that. So I totally love that. And I agree. Actually, I love how you frame that. That's so brilliant because the way you frame things is so sim like you, you make it really easy for people to understand what you're saying, but it's actually like a pretty sophisticated practice in life mm -hmm. is to be able to be like, okay, where's my responsibility in this? For example, like this documentary, I talk about my experience with the label. It's really easy to vilify a label, right? The big corporation, but actually I had a lot of responsibilities within it myself. What can I work on? You know, and I'm always looking at that too. Like for example, yeah, it's like, if I want to work with an artist I really admire, why would they say yes? Like what, what am I bringing to the mm -hmm. table to like help add to the magic? I love that so much. And also how do, cause I'm always trying to, what Thor, helps me propel me forward, mm -hmm. right? Because like, does this thought serve me? Yes or no? Like that's kind of how I've now think about things because it's an easier way for me to stop thinking badly about myself. Because every time that negative thought comes up, you're not good enough. Okay, well Lisa, does this thought serve what you're trying to do or not serve you? It doesn't serve you. Great, let's get rid of it. Let's replace it with a thought that does serve you. Maybe you're not good enough yet. So now one of my favorite quotes of all time was Steve Martin, the comedian of all people, be so good they can't ignore you. Yeah. And so now if I live in that mantra, you said you love mantras, I go, cool, I'm just gonna be so good that Maria won't be able to ignore me. Yeah. And so for a year, I was like metaphorically, you know, karate kid waxing off from, you know, wax on, wax off, I was practicing. And so a year later, to cut a very long story short, I was on her podcast, she was on mine, and now we're really good friends. That's so um, cool. But now here's a little twist to the story, actually, to your point about the story we tell ourselves, it turned out in like an evening where I'm telling her, do you know you actually said no to me the first time? She was like, what? We figured out that her mum was diagnosed with stage four cancer and she was diagnosed with a brain tumor all at the same time. And then I reach out and ask if she wants to come on my show. So the truth was she told her team to say no to people. So she didn't even realize I'd reached out. But wow. now going to, if I told him, what story did I tell myself when she said no? So that's also, it goes to show, it's like, we are what we believe, right? Because you didn't decide like, oh, well, I, I don't want to interview her anyway. You had the attitude of like, how can I be better for her? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. even though like that wasn't even the story, but then you gained all these skills. So it's really cool how our mindset can dictate the quality of our lives. Because mm -hmm. now you have new skills and you're friends with her. Mm -hmm. you know? and it's, it's, yeah, the self-esteem mm -hmm. part is such a huge moment of like when you get rejected, when something pushes back, 
up, whether it's a partner or whether it's a boss or a record label or a friend, like no matter that situation, how do you respond to it? And when I look at your life, when I look at your career, when I look at how you show up every day, it's the fact that you just keep going. (laughs) <laughs> like in all yeah. honesty right and when mm-hmm. I think about what is the difference between people that are you know at your level that can comfortably now talk about your partner with such a smile on your face talk about your career talk about your family and knowing where you've come from it's that it's the fact that you have gotten up every time you have fallen to your knees mm. thanks for reflecting that back to me yeah yeah it's it's like at this point the friends who I've known for a long time, like I work with on, on my team, I work with someone who I've known since 2008. I like keeping like long, just just good relationships. And we joke like we're still here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's like we're at that point in our career where we can see each other like, oh, you're still here. Nice. You know, it's it's an accomplishment to continue to show up mm-hmm. <laughs> with it. That's just enough of an act, you know. Mm-hmm. And I've heard you actually say when you feel overwhelmed, you do something like you ask yourself, where are my feet? Mm-hmm. Like, I, talk to me about that. That's super powerful. It's um, learning. It, it's it's just, I feel like the mind is such a powerful machine. Um, I think as a leader, the mind sometimes can lead us astray because it is so creative and creates scenarios that aren't real. But the body is like a truth teller. The body's just right here. Mm-hmm. And so it keeps me really grounded and like helps me zoom back in because when I tend to overthink, it feels like I'm doing a big zoom out and things can feel very overwhelming. So I zoom back in. I tend to try to ask myself, like, do I need to zoom in or do I need to zoom out? Right. That's what literally I was going to ask you. Mm. When do you know the difference? It's like when I'm a little too uh, precious about my life, I'm a little too worried about a detail, uh, my career or a personal relationship. It's like, let me zoom out for a second. It's like, oh, there's people who are like struggling to pay their rent. There are people who are really like navigating terminal illnesses. Like I have it really, I have it really good right now. And then sometimes when the news and all this stuff overwhelms me, it's like zoom in to my feet. Where's my body? I'm right here. Um, and I can do something to like give my body a little bit of rest. Like I have control over this, that the big world, I don't have control over, Mm -hmm. you know? How much do you practice gratitude then? Oh my gosh. It's so funny you bring bring that up. The two words that I'm really surrounding myself with a lot too is gratitude and awe. Mm. Like I want to be like, okay, every time my Bluetooth works, I'm like, that's amazing. (laughs) That's amazing. (laughs) Or like every time like my wireless printer works, I'm like, she obeyed. She obeyed. It's so cool. Like I try to just surround myself. Because I remember being a kid watching, like, you know, adults being like, yeah, more, more, more. Like, I was like, this is all amazing. You all understand this, right? Like, this is mind blowing. And so it keeps me, it keeps me just really engaged and grateful. And so regardless of what happens, like, say we release this documentary, I release new music, regardless, I'm trying to get in the practice of, like, gratitude, mm-hmm. gratitude. Um, cause I spent my twenties being like really eager to prove my worth and prove my decision to my parents. Like this is, I did this, I did this. See, like I succeeded the, the shiny thing. Um, and now I'm like, I don't know if that's really like contributing to the love in the universe. Like, mm. so gratitude and awe, I like to walk around with that. And it, it just like gratitude snaps me right back in. If I'm like, Ugh. You know, like if I'm frustrated with something, I was like, okay, list three, three people who have been great to you. And I'm like, oh, well, okay, fine. I'm pretty blessed. <laughs> <laughs> no more complaints. You know? I love the word awe. Oh. Like, I just love the word. I love it. Yeah. Oh, just three, three little letters strung yeah. together. It's like the biggest and most transformative feeling. Mm-hmm. I have a bit of a love-hate relationship, though, with gratitude. Ah, okay, let's talk about so, it. So, because gratitude, I think, could be amazing when you're feeling really badly or you're focusing on something that maybe doesn't matter, using gratitude to, like you even said, like snap you back is so freaking strong. But for me, 
um, I was, the plan was I was just going to support my husband for a year and then we were going to make movies together. <clears throat> and so for the first year, I was a stay-at-home wife. I didn't enjoy it. I had no dreams or desires of being a stay-at-home wife. So I was using gratitude every day, right? So mm. it's like you have a roof over your head, Lisa. You know, like you should be very grateful. People don't have roofs over your head. You've got a partner that loves you that's willing to go out and work every day and you can stay home, right? So the gratitude. What ended up happening is I used that every single day and that one year turned into eight years. And so now, eight years later, I was a stay-at-home wife and the gratitude had turned into, I don't love my life, I'm really miserable. But how ungrateful are you? You know, how grateful mm. should you be that you've mm. got a roof over your head? And I'm... now that gratitude turned into a toxic gratitude. Yeah, oh, I love that you pointed that out. Yeah, because when it's like, when anything is leaned on, with, as the answer, mm -hmm. it becomes not the answer. It becomes yeah. maybe a toxic thing, like you said, because the acknowledging gratitude and acknowledging your desire for more all at the same time is cool. Which is why I actually loved and found it fascinating that you put gratitude with awe, because I actually think that those two now go very well based on what I just said, right? Because now it's like, but you still got awe for magic. Yes. And like that is... And something potentially more. Yeah, that's... And that's okay. To, I used to like... I used to struggle with the fact that I would achieve one goal and I'd want the next thing. I'm like, when am I ever going to be satisfied? And then there is the... Yes, gratitude can help me be grateful for where I already am. And also the universe is constantly expanding. So I am part of the universe. So I am going to be constantly curious to expand too. Mm -hmm. Like allowing myself both... Like, yeah, we're always like in the belly of a paradox somehow. Oh, I like that bit. That's a song lyric right there. Surely <laughs> something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, write it down. Yeah, I know, I'll yeah. credit you. Yeah. Um, so actually speaking of writing, how on earth do you keep your creativity alive? Because so many, so for me, I stopped doing my artwork for 10 years because I was like, no, all that matters is work, work, work. And we built Quest, which was amazing, but I let go of something that I love. I have a lot of my community that, love to draw, I love to sing and write. But they if they've stopped even for a year, they're petrified mm -hmm. to start up again. Mm -hmm. Um it goes back to what my music teachers taught me was the slow it down. Um and and just lower all expectations. I love lowering all my expectations but having really high standards, if that makes sense. Oh no, explain. Yeah, it's like it's like if I, if I take this out, my brain out of my creative process, it actually works better. So, so let me explain. So if I use my brain to think about how I haven't created for a year, I can write lots of thoughts about that. I'm lazy. I'm not dedicated. There's lots of things my brain is going to create. Doesn't help the situation. There was this one time in the studio, I was like so tired, I didn't want to do it, but I was like, I gotta go. I want to be devoted. I was like, I'm just gonna turn the computer on and just open the software. That's it. I'm just gonna open the software and look at it. That's my job for today. And I went there, I looked at it, and then I played around a little bit, didn't do too much, but then it kind of like built that trust. So I have a dancer friend. She, she, um, she's one of my dearest friends. Her name's Kylie Shea. And she um, goes to the studio to train every day. But she has days where she doesn't want to go. So she'll just go. And she's like, I just like walked around the studio and did swan arms. She just did this. <laughs> she just walked in circles and did this. And like talked to her friends on the phone. And she's like, I showed up. It's just kind of like mm. lower the expectations when we're developing a relationship. It's like romance, right? Mm. We don't go in like we're gonna get married on our first date. It's like, no, you're gonna have a cup of tea and you're gonna talk about, I don't know, like what color you like or something. Mm. And then you build. And so then when we build, then my standards of what we build as we get there will be high because mm. I love like challenging myself. Like no detail is too small. That's like something that the founder of North Face says, mm. like no detail is too small. And I love using that. So. Does that make sense? Yeah, because what I was wondering is, because on your bad days, right? Because I assume mm -hmm. you have bad days, oh, just yeah. like anybody else. Oh, when yeah. you feel terrible, maybe mm -hmm. your voice isn't great. Maybe mm -hmm. you're kind of sucking and you're mm -hmm. trying to write a rhythm and it doesn't come together. The story you may tell yourself is, oh, you've lost it. 
you're no good anymore. Right? <laughs> yeah, like that, yeah. you had that one hit or whatever, that three hits. You had the ten, right? But the story you make up can come rushing back in those moments. Yes. So how do you make sure that doesn't then stop you and that you don't dive into it? It's that, right? The little steps. Yes. And there's a there's a there's a little thing that I learned that is not a little thing. It's a big thing. It's three phases to creativity. First step: create like a child. Second step: refine like a scientist. Third step, surrender like a warrior. And so first step, create like a child, Blech. have fun. Like when I was in the studio with Raphael Sadiq and I went to the bathroom, I was like, oh my God. And then finally I was like, okay, stop. <laughs> and I remember sitting back down, <laughs> Raphael's gonna be like, man, she went through so many things. <laughs> I, that yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. So I was sitting in the studio and I was like, I gotta write the best song. This is Raphael Sadiq. And I have like the computer on. I'm like, mm. I'm gonna construct it. And I was like, oh no, I'm using my head too much. I was like, stop have fun, create like a child, put the computer down, closed it, and then listen to the guitar he was playing and just danced. And then the song came, song started coming out. And I was like, don't doubt any of it. Just let it all come out. Let it all come out. Don't edit, don't edit. Next phase, let, let the magic dance, dance, dance and swirl and come in. And then the next phase, the next day, edit, 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 edit. Next day, edit more, next day, edit more if you need. And then eventually we got to just release it. And the warrior in you is believing that it will, you're brave enough to let it out. To brave the enough to let it out, whatever people may say, um, mm. trusting that it's going to reach whoever it's going to reach. Like I've done my job and I need to have the discipline to not try to fix it mm. or try to, you know, try to like take the song back and make more edits. No, it's done. Let it be out there. I mean, art is never done and it's abandoned. It's just like, <laughs> just like get out there. It's so true. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so the, those three phases, so I would say, how do we, how do we become children? And I think it's less of this. I think it's less of this more body, more heart, more gut, you know, and then, and then editing. If you want to learn how to spot a toxic person and their manipulation tactics, then click here right now. Any one of us can be victimized by someone who's a manipulator, but most often than not, they seek out their prey. We have to talk about patterns then, right? Like if a person is gaslighting you, if a person...